Hello and welcome to Sunday's Wardy's Waffle. I've got a bit of an apology to make today because it was meant to be part one of my visit to Newark Sugar Beet Factory. I mentioned in my last video that's where we would be today. I have got the video all edited. Uh, this is the outside, this is part one, and there's been a bit of a miscommunication between me and British Sugar because I thought there was only one person had to see the video and pass it off before I could post it. Uh, well, apparently now there's uh, there's three or four, and uh, and I think two of those aren't haven't been at work these last few days, uh, or yesterday anyway, when I sent the video off to them. So uh, it's going to be next week, I'm afraid now, until they pass the video and uh, allow me to post it. But everything should be all right, and then we'll have part two, uh, the video after that. Anyway, so what I'm going to do today, uh, so you've got something for this Sunday, I'm going to look at one or two of our winter wheat crops, which we've got here. This is on the heath. Uh, after after oats. I'm going to look at some of our wheat crops. Also take a look at the later drilled crops. If you remember we went through uh, 10th of November I think it was where we, we drilled uh, some of those uh, later wheats that were, if you remember there was some dust blowing as well which was unusual. So I'm going to look at one or two of those because they're just coming through. I'm also going to look at some of our costings. One or two of you have asked how do I um, cost our machinery out. I've got some really good spreadsheets that I've designed uh, over the years and I'll just take you through some of our machinery costings because I think you might find that fascinating. And uh, also into the workshop, look at our, our drill for the project that we're now, we're now starting and one or two other bits um, around the farm. Uh, also, by the way, also looking at my microphones. A few of you have asked, uh, how do I um, uh, record and what microphones do I use now that there's no wind coming through on the thing? So I'll go through one or two of the, the sort of the equipment and the things I use to make my videos and how I edit them as well. So without any more for me now, let's crack on with this and look at uh, some of our winter wheat crops and... Uh, uh, thanks very much for watching hope you enjoy it please click like subscribe and the bell icon to alert you when i post my videos which are every sunday at 8 a.m and uh, some wednesdays as well when we're busy so we'll see you at the end thanks for watching got a deer just ran out the hedge in front of me this is up on the heath where i live there are one or two about up here but not very often do i see one uh, their own. So this is on our very light sandy soils. You can see there there's some stone in it and you can just tell by the soil it, it's quite sandy when you look at that. Quite a lot of uh, texture in it of sand and it's probably only about 10 or 12 percent clay and um, in the region of um, 20 percent silt and the rest sand so it is quite easy working you can see with the stone as well uh, there's no dikes up here there's no drains it's really easy working free draining soil we've just had a bit of rain last night and you can tell looking at my boots not a lot stuck to them so this was uh, oats last year spring oats last year and all we've done with this is we've run our Simba Express across it. You can see the straws all, all mixed in and then drilled it with our Simba Free Flow. Looking quite well here, so I'm pleased with this. It's a variety called Cranium, which suits uh, light land. Um, a bit of disease, you can just see a bit of disease coming in some of these uh, leaves at the minute, a bit yellow. Um, but generally, uh, it's a good variety for, for light land, so we'll see how we go. So this was planted... I think because if you remember we didn't have our 8RX John Deere it didn't arrive until the 13th of October and so that's when these fields were planted which they could have been done earlier but we didn't have a tractor to pull the drill then so yeah pleased with this looking well 50 acre field nice good long rounds you can see fields really long probably I don't know just guessing here 600 meters 600 yards long something like that and uh, always work rates in here are always really good 50 acres so about 20 hectares I've just come to another block of land now that's on our uh, heavy ground and this is one of the uh, farms to look after, one of the contract farms we have. Now there's a block of land here, there's four fields, uh, probably about 100 acres, something like that, just to touch over. There's four fields here that haven't been winter wheat apart from now uh, for 10 years. It was really, really bad for black grass and those of you who are not aware of what black grass is, uh, this is a picture of it. I can't show you anything live because we haven't got any in here at the moment. And um, it was a massive problem for us and the whole farm. And it's the biggest yield robber uh, of, uh, of cereals in uh, across England at the moment. And, and uh, I know there are a lot of people saying you can't uh, get rid of it, but we can. Uh, and you can actually get rid of it with various things you do. We've done a lot over the years um, trying to help and get rid of it. Delayed drilling, changed varieties. 
and uh, spring crops which we've had in here and so that uh, situation here has worked. We've had spring crops here, whether it's spring barley, mainly spring oats as well the last couple of years, um, for, for 10 years here and no winter wheat. And that is how we've got rid of it. And, uh, and in my view, if you want to get rid of black grass, you've actually got to stop growing winter wheat in those bad black grass fields. And, and so we went to a traffic light system. So our green fields were the fields on the heath, such as the field you've just uh, seen a minute ago and that winter wheat. They're fields that haven't got any black grass at all on the light land. Our next fields, the amber ones, are ones that have got black grass, but it's manageable with delayed drilling um, and things like that uh, and, uh, and, and competitive varieties to help it tiller and smother the black grass. Then the red fields are the ones that are definitely no for growing winter wheat, really bad for black grass and we just stop growing winter wheat completely. This is one of those fields, this is the first wheat we've had in here for 10 years. So I'll just turn the camera around and I'm really pleased with this, at how this looks. And um, at the minute there isn't any black grass in it. There will be some come next June a little bit when we hand rogue every field, uh, but I'll get onto that uh, nearer uh, as the season progresses. You can see now looking at, at these at this crop, really nice even crop here. Not particularly heavy soil, you can see looking at the soil there, quite a lot of silt in here. Probably only about 25-30% clay, but upwards of 35-40% uh, of silt. And silt can be as difficult as clay, but here it's, it's not. So uh, yeah, this is a really good field at the minute and I'm pleased with how this looks. So this variety in this field is also cranium, which is a feed wheat and uh, it was actually the very first field we planted this one when the John Deere arrived so just before uh, the field you saw up on the heath a minute ago and from memory seed rate was about 375 seeds a square meter so planted 13th to 14th of October established well and uh, yeah lovely even plant stand when you look at it now cultivations here well this is one of the fields where we had one of the demo with a small disc machine and this is the Vardastat carrier and I wasn't that impressed with this carrier it didn't work it very consistently uh, consistent depth and it was a bit bunched and it didn't leave it very level so we actually came across here um, with our express after that and then we did it with the culture press just to finish it off before the drill so unfortunately this has had three passes on here to get this field cultivated yes they were low cost passes passes um, so fuel usage would be low uh, but whereas some of our other fields have only been done once with the express and there's an, the same over, across there same variety obviously cranium and this is another one of those fields that we haven't had uh, winter wheat on uh, for 10 years apart from now so really pleased um, with how this looks you can see there's an old windmill that's been converted into a house and I think that is on the market at the minute but uh, that's been there, it's an old wood yard there on the side of the A17. It's a mill where they made furniture as well. So um, yeah, nice, uh, nice place there. If anybody wants a house on the side of a windmill. The uh, wheel on the my discovery needs a bit of airing, but just before we do that, I was just gonna show you the project we're doing in here with the drill filling trailer. Some of you have seen this on the video the other day and we've got the auger folded out now and uh, we're gonna to have to make this a bit longer and it, it was actually seized inside. We've got the auger screw out and that's the auger screw, had to put a forklift on and pull it out. It's been used for fertiliser before, and that's why it's really rusty. That's the extension, because that goes in that part there to make the auger longer, but we're not sure still that it's quite right. Um, and uh, it needs to be longer. We're going to back the drill up, I think, rather than go over the side. Uh, we might even put the auger out the back yet, but the idea is the whole thing is going to be self-contained. And um, at the minute, you obviously put a tractor on the front end plug the pipes in and the pipes hydraulic, hydraulically power the auger. But we want to make it self-contained so we don't have to have a tractor on it. And we're going to park it at the end of a field somewhere. Uh, when we fill the drill, we're going to put an engine in there. That's the aim of it. And then just drop it off and leave it self-contained so Tom, when he's filling the drill, can just um, start the engine up and fill the drill without having a tractor on it. At the minute, it only holds eight tonnes of seed, I think, but we're going to put some greedy boards on it to make it a bit more. Maybe look at the wheels or even put another axle on. We don't know yet what we're going to do, but it's our project for this winter and this next year. Um, whether it will be ready for spring drilling, I don't quite think so, but that's it now with the auger folded out. So I'm just in the old workshop now. That's the tractor that uh, Attila from uh, Hungary uh, bought. We've still got it here at the minute. He's um, going to get it in a container and get it shipped across to Hungary when he's got a minute. Anyway, these are the two uh, horse augers that you've seen before. We might end up using these yet and join these together on the, for that uh, trailer. We're not really sure yet what we're going to do. We only just started to look at it. So we've got a lot of sort of head scratching and a lot of uh, thinking to do about whether we use these or, or, something, uh, or something else. And oh, and by the way, while we're at it, 
We've got, still got these windows here. If anybody's after some windows, we've still got some windows here. And also two gas fires that were taken, all these are taken out of the house. You can see there's the windows, by the way. Still got some small ones and some bigger ones, all PVC. Um, and we've got two gas fires here as well that were in the house that were demolished. So if anybody's uh, after some gas fires, get in, uh, get in touch. The builder, Ron, also wanted us to put the bricks out of the way. So we've put these on the low loader at the start of the frost so that they're, they're uh, not getting uh, frosted or, or wet. So they've been in here sort of three weeks now, just uh, protecting them a bit. That is a bag of uh, bird food we've got from Kings. You know, they help us a lot with our um, um, cons conservation areas and our stewardship uh, uh, applications. And in here is a mix of linseed. Uh, there's um, red millet, white millet, I think. There's some um, uh, various bits of seed. I can't quite remember what's in here at the minute, but we mix that with, uh, with wheat uh, and put out in our songbird feeders. I'm now in one of our fields uh, after spring beans. And again, this isn't particularly heavy soil. It's one of our sugar beet fields. And uh, again, this looks really well. I'm pleased with this. All we've done with this, this is the field we had the um, Bednar uh, Swifter disc on demo, another small disc machine. So that's all this has had um, in here. So, uh, and it looks really well for it. Um, it was sprayed with glyphosate uh, after the spring beans because there was quite a lot of weeds growing because it was a seed crop of beans. And, uh, and so we, we did actually spray it with glyphosate. I just also wanted to just show you down this lane. Actually, I'll just turn the camera around. You'll see better. See down the lane side here, it's not come very well just, just there. And that's because uh, last spring, probably April, May, I think, Tom and Ruben mapped all the fields with Green Star and uh, some of our uh, fit lane sides here, margins, the edge to the tracks there were getting really wide. And so we, we cut them off and made them narrower, but because, because it was high, the drill rode up a bit and it just let, littered the seed on top, hasn't drilled it. We might actually have to plough just down there to get a neat edge. And you can see uh, down there, it's just the same as well down this side as well. It's probably up nearer the disc, up at the, uh, at the top there, it was probably getting on for two metres wide um, up there, these uh, margins or the edge of the track. So it was really too wide. So yeah, looking at this field here, I'm pleased with this. This is a variety called Gleam, a variety that has, uh, has predominantly done quite well over the, over the years for, for lots of people. So looking forward to seeing this at harvest time because it's looking well here at the minute. I've now just come to a block of land that we drilled in or planted the wheat uh, in early 10th to November time and you can just see, I'm not happy with these headlands, you can just see how wet they are. Uh, we did put extra seed on all these headlands, they were planted at 550 seeds a square metre, uh, whereas the field was done at 500, but you can just see how wet it is here. This is really heavy soil, difficult soil this, 55% clay. 30% silt so really as difficult as you can uh, as you can get but then when you look up the field you can actually see here there is a good number of, of plants uh, coming through obviously the uh, frost three the last three weeks of frost hasn't helped it slowed it down but it is coming through okay a little bit patchy in places but it is coming through well uh, when you look up the field it is something we notice with our Simba drill we always have had since we've had them that they sometimes can be a bit uneven coming through, but then they catch up and they look really well soon after that. Um, there's a patch here, this area here, there was an area of sewage sludge here, and that's why that's not come so well. And, uh, but looking up the headland, you can just see it's, it's all right there, but not round the outside. And it's the same with that field across the other side of the track as well, actually. And then we've got this pool of water on the edge of the field here that you saw in the video here when I did it three weeks ago we need to get rid of that and do something with that so we've got a bit of drainage work needed to do a bit of moulding maybe along this headland and uh, yeah I don't like to see water stood there isn't really any excuse from having water stood my father always said to me you can't farm wetland and he's absolutely right so many things I've learnt from him and those of you who might remember or know he died a couple of years ago and uh, was widely recognised as being one of the one of the best farmers in Lincolnshire and yes I learnt so much from him. We are going to get some of these dikes actually done out this next uh, two or three um, more two or three weeks with another drain there. This is a problem you can see there's a drain there and that drain should be working. There we go right underwater look you can see it is running and it's right on the edge of that wet spot, so it shows it's compacted. When you look at that, 
there's the drain. This is why these dikes need doing out and dropping the level of the, all these dikes here. There is a, a pipe under that culvert there where the track goes, but all these dikes need doing out and need dropping a foot. I need to come back with a spade and just clear that. Now, they have been done a few years ago, but maybe it was 10 years ago before they were done. They weren't doing properly. But the problem we've got here is the hedge comes down into the dike and the hedge is nearly in the dike bank. So we are going to have to take some of that bottom away to do this dike out properly up there. Not a big dike, as you can see, but it has got that field 67 acres there. And as the two or three drains come into this, you can see to that, it just needs sorting out along here. Driving back to the yard, this is another field that we planted wheat uh, around the 10th of, of uh, November. Looks a little bit better up the middle of the field, but still a little bit patchy. There's an area there where not a lot's come, I'm not sure why. And then obviously we've got the Agri Trials that you saw in the middle there. You saw with their special plot drill, they were drilled. They were planted uh, middle of October when the conditions were really good. They look better there. So here is the back. Big dike this one is we're going to have done out as well. And then you compare it to the hat field, which is the one we've just seen a minute ago after spring beans. Just shows the value of getting crops in the ground in good conditions early in the season. So I just wanted to show you the uh, various microphones that I use. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think it was when we were um, lifting beat and when we were dragging, uh, the microphones I was using then, I thought they distorted the sound quite a bit. And this is the ones I was using then. And these um, are Larkbird. Now you can get, the best microphones you can get are, are Rode, R-H, no, R-O-D-E. They're the best ones you can get. And I have got one of those here, but this is cordless. So what these are, this is like a self-contained charging box. And these microphones here have little lapel ones. There's a little clip on it on the back you can see there. And the green light there flashing um, means that it's uh, it was charging. You can see it charges, there's a light on the case when it's lit. It charged, the case charges as well, but it wants charging at the minute. So I've got two of these microphones and then that plugs into the bottom of the phone and that's the receiver part. And so you pair them up. There's a light on, on the bottom of that as well. You can see that, that there when it starts to flash when I plug it in the bottom of this iPhone. And then these two microphones pick it up. You can see the flashing now, the waiting to be paired. So what you can do with this is I, I can wear one and then if I'm talking to somebody 10 yards away, he can have one as well and my phone will pick it up. Um, but it was that these were the ones that I thought were just actually um, a bit muffled. Then also I have actually got as well some um, mufflers for them. So when it's windy, you can put these on like that and uh, and that just cuts the wind out as well. So these are the ones that I've got that are cordless, but these are the ones I thought that were a bit muffled um, when I was using them in the day. Then the other one I've got, this is a Rode microphone and this is a, a wire lawn, you can see a cord. Um, it's got a normal jack plug like that, but then you can buy these little adapters, the, the um, uh, lightning adapters that plug into your phone. So you just plug that in like that. And this is the one I use mostly. And sometimes, uh, and I apologize for this, occasionally you'll see the corner of one of this cable will be in view of the phone. Um, it's got a quite a long lead. It's got about a meter long lead on it. Um, and so often I don't need that. Um, and that's why I coil it up and you can see it sometimes comes into view. The muffler is what you call Rycoat. And again, they're meant to be the best. Now, the Rode microphones and the Rycoat mufflers are the ones that when Countryfile came here to do some filming a few months ago, I asked those guys which they used and they said these two are the best. But there's a lapel clip there. Um, you can see that there, that little clip there plugs into onto your pal. And then the app that I use to edit all my videos is one called Splice. There are lots of apps on the Apple Store that you can use. And I think that might be the same one that Ollie uses actually to edit his videos. And, and uh, it is quite good. You can overlay stuff. Uh, and so that's the app I use though. And, and, uh, and it works quite well and you get some good seamless changes, I think. So that's the, the things, I, that's the microphones I use um, to cut my wind noise out and, and uh, the app I use to edit the videos. So another thing I just wanted to show you today was um, the, one of the spreadsheets I use for uh, working out my machinery costings. I've been doing this for a number of years. When we first looked at swapping tractors um, a few years ago, and I'm probably talking about now over 20 years ago, when we first, maybe 25 years ago, uh, when we first had a rubber track challenger tractor, and uh, we, we really needed to know whether we could justify one or not. And I employed um, a guy from ADAS, 
and uh, and he was the one that first got me into machinery costings and and uh, through his costings and his help we realized we needed to swap um two wheel tractors and uh, a steel track track marshal crawler that we had at the time uh, to replace it with a rubber track challenger and so that's what first got me into looking at machinery costings and so the spreadsheet i'm about to show you is something that that it, it started on with the lines of the adas spreadsheet but it's then um, been transformed since then. And ADAS, uh, for those of you who are not sure what ADAS is, it stands for Advisory Development, so Agricultural Advisory, Agricultural Development Advisory Service. Let's get that right. So that's what it stood for. And uh, they're a sort of a national organisation with regional centres. And, um, and they were the ones that, that uh, helped me with machinery costings quite a lot. So I'll just turn the camera now and, and uh, show you this, uh, this spreadsheet and how we work them out. This is the spreadsheet I use for working out individual tractor and machinery costs. And whether it's a machine or a tractor, the spreadsheet's nearly the same, except with a machine or a tractor with an engine, you need to know how many hours a year you're going to do. And if that's a machine that goes on the back of a tractor, it's how many hectares or acres an hour it does. That's the only difference. So starting at the top, this is our quad track that we don't have at the minute. We need to know the retail price of the tractor. So in November 18, it was 472,000 just over, which is, yes, staggering amount for a tractor. And the uh, actual cost we paid, this is including discount, but no trading was just over 303. We've actually kept the tractor four years. Now you can obviously can change that and put in whatever figures you like to get a true figure. Sold it for 240,000. So that meant that only uh, depreciation was 5.7%. Now, most accountants work on something like 15 to 18% depreciation, but we're actually finding uh, we're a lot less than that because we're getting a good deal at the start of the machine, so we're not losing, uh, losing as much. So annual depreciation, so that obviously that figure is the, um, uh, the figure we're buying at, minus the figure we sell at, divide by the number of years we keep it, and that comes out at just over or nearly £16,000 a year. We then have finance charges on it, and the total finance charges on this tractor over the life, over the, uh, we've just finished paying for it, before we sold it was £10,000, divide that by four years, and obviously it's just over £2,500 a year. Now, we need to know the interest rate here, which obviously um, the last that was tractor went in March before the interest rates start to go up, so I've got 2% in there. And the reason we need to know that is because the annual interest on half the actual cost. Now, um, we obviously need to allow uh, for when we sell the tractor and get the money back in. So, of course, we've, we've bought it for 303, we've sold it for 240. So you could actually say that this figure here is a bit high. It ought to be a bit less than that, but I'd rather these figures were higher to give a, a, a higher running cost uh, than actually have a nasty surprise. And then spares and repairs here, that is actually wrong. I allowed that as if we kept the tractor for 10 years, and uh, that was for in case we... Uh, we um, changed the tracks. Obviously, tracks are about, I don't know, they used before £5,000 a corner. I think they're probably nearly £8,000 a corner now on this tractor. So that's for the lifetime of the tractor. The actual cost we had here was a lot less than that. So um, I'm going to put a figure in uh, there of, um, we'll put a figure in of, let me just, there, we'll put a figure in of 825 because that's how much we actually spent on servicing of the tractor over the lifetime. So you can see all together now, annual insurance there, interesting little note there. If you're not quite sure what the actual cost of the tractor is uh, on insurance, it's roughly eight pound per thousand pounds of uh, purchase price. So say two and a half thousand pounds, annual running cost 24,751 pounds of this tractor. Total hours, we would have used 600, but because the tractor went just before it was four years old, um, it was actually about 480 hours a year, which, yes, that's not a lot. That's obviously taking that running cost up. So just interesting note here, if I put that up to, say, 700 hours a year, watch that figure down there change. You can see straight away, the more hours you do, the cheaper the tractor is to operate. So we'll put that back to where, we, where it should be, which is 480 on average, so it's 66.56 per hour. That is without fuel, but everything else is included in that. Now, where I put the fuel in, and I'm not gonna go into this too much detail because it'll take too long, but you see the figure we've just brought across here of 66.56. That's per hour, and this is the table for uh, every machine. So that's the tractor cost 
These are the cultivation on the machinery costs on the back of the tractor. And we've got the same, whether it's a fast track, whether it's the case Puma, whether it's the combine, but just an interesting one to note here with the combine, I've got uh, figures here for all seed rate, winter wheat, spring barley. They're all the same cost per hour figure for the combine, but it's a different per hectare figure. And we purely get that on the work rates here because each crop, the work rate will be different. And then don't forget as well, cost here, when you're combining as well, you need to look at um, your tractors and trailers because you've got to have those obviously getting the crop from the field uh, into the shed so my combining costs allow for that so this column here is our actual operating combining uh, costs uh, and then this figure here is including two tractors and trailers don't forget fuel um, we need to at the minute I've got in there 100p a litre it's around about 80 at the minute so when you put that 80 in there watch this fuel this is the fuel table this purple one watch these figures change they've all come down a bit so this is the fuel figure so just for drilling we're using 11 pound 96 per hectare here with our with our free flow drill uh, on fuel so around about five pound per acre anyway quick run through on our on this spreadsheet here and it just shows you how i work out all my machinery uh, costs and uh, some really interesting and fascinating i can spend hours looking at this so that's had a quick look at all the machinery costs and, and how we work it out. It is quite detailed. I've rushed through it, I know. Um, I didn't want to bore you with it, uh, but I will go through some of these and some of the costs and looking at costs virtually in a bit more detail in, uh, in a few weeks' time. Anyway, that's it for this week's update. Oh, just remember as well, one more thing. We have got the... Um, our, conference along with Agri on January the 26th at Newark Showground. This is the flyer for that conference. These are the details. Uh, we're going to be looking at the results from the direct drilling demonstration we had in April. We're going to be looking at um, all the root mass results, not just yield. Um, we're going to look at costs as well, fuel use, carbon, link to carbon and link to soil health as well. So for those of you who, who um, didn't, couldn't make the demo, now's your chance to come and see the results. And for those of you who did make it, and I've had one or two um, sort of comments from people that saying that it was an absolute waste of time doing it and that they didn't learn anything from it. Uh, well, here's your chance now to come and uh, to come to the conference and tell us what you thought and what, how you would have done it and if you'd have done it differently or better. So please do come along to that. This is the link. You need to email Becky to register to come to this conference. This is the flyer for it. Please do that. The um, registration details are below in the description of this email at the bottom. So please do that. Anyway, that's it from me. Uh, and again, I apologise for not having Sugar Beet uh, or the visit to British Sugar um, Factory in this video. It will be in the next video. Part one is outside, which is the um, sampling, which is the intake part of it and how the Sugar Beet is stockpiled and how they sample it and weigh it and everything outside before it goes into the factory and part two will be inside the factory how the actual processing uh, happens so that's it from me thank you very much for watching have a happy new year thank you very much for your support over the last year i hope you've had a nice restful period over christmas and new year and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video which all being well will be part one outside the of the intake of our sugar beet into british sugar newark factory